Welcome to Leviton Contractor Connect. The content of this video is for informational and educational purposes only. The opinions expressed by the panelists do not necessarily represent the views or opinion of Leviton. Leviton does not make any representations or warranties with respect to the accuracy or applicability of the information. Hi, welcome to Leviton's Contractor Connection podcast series. My name is Tom Degden. I'm a contractor channel manager here at Leviton. We're, today we're going to be talking about arc fault. Uh, there's a lot of controversy or uh, misunderstanding about arc fault. So today we're going to take a deep dive and explore that. We have some special guests with us today. We have the industry recognized code expert, Mr. Mike Holt, who is going to be uh, weighing in on, this, on the topic. We'll be asking him some questions. We have his colleague and uh, vice president of Mike Holt Enterprises, uh, Mr. Brian House, and uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Bill Grande, who is a director of uh, product marketing at Leviton Manufacturing. So without further ado, let's get into the, uh, the Q&A here. And first of all, we just want to ask Mike Holt about what he's been up to these days. Mike is a eight-time national barefoot water skiing champion. He also has a passion for downhill mountain biking. Mike, what have you been up to these days? And what exactly is downhill mountain biking? Well, go on the internet, go to mikeholt.com slash Mike, and there's about five videos that you can see what I do on downhill mountain biking. But basically, you get a ski lift, takes you to the top of the mountain. There's big jumps and drops and technical features. And I started in 2020 when I was about uh, 69 years old. And in four months, I was jumping 60-foot tables. Oh, wow. uh, and you'll see that on the videos. And five weeks ago today, uh, no, four weeks ago today, I came out of the trauma center. I was at a trauma center hospital for seven days, broke 11 bones in the back on seven ribs, uh, had a collapsed lung. I had to have surgery on the diaphragm. And I got out of the hospital four weeks ago today. And then two days out of the hospital, I walked to 5K. Four days after exiting the trauma center, I walked a 7K. I actually hiked that one. That was in the mountains in New Mexico um, on, on my bike. I got on my bike uh, three weeks after I got out of the hospital. I'm riding what I would consider to be very careful, very slowly. So yesterday, my top speed was 31 miles an hour, just being confident and just being careful. So that's what I do now is downhill mountain biking. And by the way, Please pray for my wife. She has to live with me. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't That's know about now. Well, I don't of about course, the... I work. We're writing, working on the 2023 code and updating our product. So I'm still running a business. But that's my my passion that keeps me, I'll say, sane. Right. That's what I'm doing. I was going to say, I don't, I don't know about the jumps, but the uh, the downhill sounds good to me. The All the good parts about riding a bike without actually having to pedal uphill. It <laughs> sounds like fun. It's a little different kind of downhill that you might be thinking. <laughs> You'll see the videos of mycoat.com slash Definitely, we'll Take check them out. Take a look at those videos. They're, they're kind of cool. Okay, so let's get into it. Today we're talking about misunderstood NEC requirements, starting with AFCI, and then we'll move into other areas like GFCI uh, and other broader electrical topics. But let's get right into uh, AFCI. And it's uh, a point of discussion because there's a lot of confusion out there among uh, contractors, end users, homeowners, and uh, more specifically, uh, I want to just explain for the audience in case anybody who was unfamiliar with AFCI. Mike, what is an AFCI? Well, basically it's a computer uh, imposed into circuit breakers and right now in receptacles. What the computer does it's looking at the current waveform. So you have to understand waveforms, basic electrical theory. So you have a current that probably follows some kind of waveform. But whenever there's a, a hot and a neutral, or a, or a yeah, hot and a neutral, and they seem to get real, real close to each other because of some compression, then during the voltage waveform, as it gets near peak voltage, it can create like a little arc. And when you have that little tiny arc near the peak waveform, it causes the current waveform to change from what it would normally be. So then they go into computers and they, they test all these different kinds of arcs. They say, okay, that's a light bulb that blew up. Okay, that's a motor that started. That's a vacuum cleaner, that's a treadmill. And they, 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 they record all these waveforms. And then they have a computer that every half cycle 
of a waveform, I think it's like the last nine cycles or 30 cycles, they look at the waveform. So they say, okay, here's a half cycle waveform. Okay, got it. Then they look at the computer. They search all the other waveforms. Okay, yeah, those are these are identified as not arcing faults or maybe even arcing faults. And when they match, match they count. Okay, that's number one. And then they look for another half wave, half cycle waveform. And they keep doing this analyzing, analyzing each waveform to what is expected in the computer. And when they find a match, they record a match. Now it takes so many of these matches within a given number of waveforms where they say, you know what? We're going to categorize that as an arcing fault. Open the protected device. Now that's called a parallel arcing fault. They're also looking for what is called, a, these are called combination arc fault circuit interrupters. And, and they're, not, they're not dual function. A dual function would be AFCI and GFCI. But a combination AFCI is looking for a parallel fault, which I just described. It looks at the waveforms, counts it. It looks, you know, it's distorted. It's considered an arcing fault. It counts them all up. It says open. Then you have what is called a series arcing fault. That's where you have a cord and it's like frayed. And then all of a sudden, as the current is, and it, it, you have to have a load of five amperes though. So you have to have something plugged into it where a parallel fault doesn't need anything plugged in at all. Where a series arcing fault takes place when there's a five amp load, and that's the test, that's a standard, five amp load. And then if you get a little break between wires and that current is like having to jump across that gap, that creates if you had an AM radio, that would create like a static. Or if you had an AM radio and you had lightning, it, 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 it creates a high frequency signal. Now, different manufacturers use different techniques to determine whether that is a series arc. And if it is, there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Different manufacturers have proprietary systems. Then it says, oh, well, that's an arc, a, a series arc. And then the computer says like a series arc or parallel arc. Then it says, open the circuit. So it's looking for the event where there's an arcing event that a normal protected device, like a regular circuit breaker, would be looking for a waveform considerably different. And so this works much faster. Um, it's designed to clear a fault so you don't have heat that a regular breaker would detect. So in other words, you got a breaker that is going to have uh, overload protection, short circuit protection, ground fault protection, and now it has arc fault protection, where receptacles would only have arc fault protection. So it's designed to protect the events of a possible fire. But if you have a loose screw and a wire on a loose screw, and it, you would think it's arcing because you can see it, it's red, that is not an arcing fault, and an AFCI will not detect that event. That's called a glowing um, a glowing terminal. Hope that short version so you can make it. It could ultimately go to an arcing fault, but that's not a guarantee. So that's just a poor connection, high resistance, not a good connection. And just as a point of uh, note here, uh, sounds similar to GFCI, right? But there's AFCIs and there's GFCIs. GFCI stands for ground fault circuit interrupters. GFCIs are more for personal protection and protects people versus AFCIs Property protection protects the house. Smartphones have become a big part of everyday life. While they offer many benefits, they all have one requirement which can be challenging at times. We're talking about the need to keep them charged and finding a place to plug in. That's why Leviton has pioneered the USB charging receptacle and continues to expand our product line. Introducing the new combination GFCI USB receptacle. That's right, we've paired our SmartLock Pro GFCI receptacle with dual Type A USB ports to enable charging smartphones and other devices in areas that require GFCI protection. We're talking about garages, kitchens, bathrooms, basements, and anywhere the NEC requires GFCI protection for receptacles. We also keep improving the specs on our USB line. This device delivers up to twice the charging power of the competition at 24 watts. It also contains all the smart chip technology the Leviton USB line is known for, as well as tamper-resistant outlets for added safety. Check out the entire line at leviton.com slash USB. GFCI is required by the NEC in many locations in the home, uh, mostly around water. 
Uh, AFCIs, the way I always remember it is wherever we're probably very more familiar with GFCIs, where they're required in the home. Uh, the areas in the home, typically around water, garages, bathrooms, kitchens, require GFCIs. Other areas of the home, uh, bedrooms, uh, living rooms, such, require AFCI. Then they, there's two areas that require both, and that is uh, uh, laundry areas and kitchens. So uh, that would require, as Mike alluded to before, a, a dual function AFCI, GFCI. Okay. Uh, let me make a comment sure, on Sure, Mike. That. Go ahead. Okay. 210.8 is the rules for branch circuits. So you need to make sure you get your code book out and take a look at, well, where is GFCI protection required? 210.8. Well, where is AFCI protection? That's 210.12. And Tom, what you just mentioned about the laundry areas and the kitchen areas, that is a 2020 change. Prior to that, Good point. so there's been an evolution in GFCI since 1971 is where they expand the areas. And it's not necessarily water, but it's moisture, basement, but it keeps expanding, okay? And then, and I think it's 1999 is what AFCI started. And then, of course, each code cycle, they keep expanding. Now they include commercial occupancies and things like that. Well, good point. And just to build on that, Mike, um, as you mentioned, the, uh, the code requires in kitchen and laundry areas. Are the, two are the two technologies compatible, GFCIs and AFCIs? You know, I get that question. Obviously, like you said, it's confusion out there. Now, GFCI is, is measuring the electrons that are going out through the device, circuit breaker receptacle, and it's measuring the electrons leaving the hot wire. And Kirchhoff's law states that all the electrons that lead the, on a circuit that lead the power supply have to return back to the power supply, which means that if I have 10 amps going on the hot wire, then how many amps are traveling on neutral? 10, it has to be. Unless somehow there's two paths for the electrons to return. One to go out to the load, and then one returns on the neutral, let's say, and the other returns on an alternate path that's ultimately gonna get you back to the source. So now there is a computer in the GFCI device that has a little circle called a CT around the hot and neutral. And it says, well, 10 went out, 10 went in, 10 came back. Perfect. Wait a minute. 10 went out and not 10 came back. And there's a, there's a tolerance of 5 million amperes plus or more. On. Then it says, well, then it's an imbalance of current. It then senses, well, that current should have returned properly. And so it trips. AFCIs, well, it's a parallel arcing fault. It's a series arcing fault. Another computer. The two have nothing to do with each other. And because they have nothing to do with each other, um, you can put them both in a single device. You can get a breaker that has GFCI protection looking for one set of circumstances. And then that circuit breaker having the same computer, but it's, it's looking for another set of circumstances. So they're two separate devices, but they can be implemented and put into a single device, but they're different now. Okay, that's, I wanna stop right there. Uh, hopefully that helps, they're, they're different. They don't, they're not incompatible because they have, they're not measuring the same thing. How about uh, wiring concerns? Any, obviously they're, they're different in the ways you just described. Is there any uh, considerations the installer would have when wiring these two different type devices? Well, GFCIs have a neutral. Well, they don't always have to have a neutral, but they're measuring currents going out and coming back. So those electricians, and same thing with AFCIs, um, they have certain configuration. You can't put two separate breakers with two separate GFCIs or two separate AFCIs and connect it to a single neutral. So you have to have the device wired as a device. In other words, if it's two hots of the neutrals called the multi-wire brand circuit, then it needs to be a two-pole breaker if it's a circuit breaker. Same thing with GFCIs or AFCIs. So wiring is just simply the device designed to be wired in a certain configuration. One pole, no problem. One breaker, one neutral, we're good. Two poles, two circuits, two hots, one neutral. And then when you get to the device, you can see a little neutral connection for that device. So that's just mechanical stuff. There's nothing you'd have to change, but GFCIs and AFCI have changed wiring in the United States 
because electricians often would take one wire here and one wire there and connect it as neutral. And, try to, and then all of a sudden, these things are not sensing. And when they sense a miswiring configuration, they just won't turn on. That, and that's what we, we call a shared neutral condition, probably is what a lot of people would hear it as. And, and it's, of course, in, on GFCIs, you could share the neutral as long as it's on the line side. So if you're going to take two hots and one neutral. But at that point, like you said, your pigtail split it out and they'll work fine. Okay, very good. Thanks, Bill. Okay, Mike and Brian. Uh, the next question I want to uh, direct more so to Brian, because Brian, I believe, Brian, I'm not speaking for you, but I believe you have a, uh, your history is electrical contractor. You have a, you were electrical contractor at one time, and that speaks to our audience, who is largely electrical contractors. And, and the question is, the industry has done a good job adding AFCI protection in new construction. Uh, I'm not even sure if contractors and consumers are aware that uh, AFCI can be even more beneficial in existing homes, older construction, retrofits. In, in a lot of these conditions, these older homes uh, may have fewer receptacles, right? So people are more apt to run extension cords, which can be more dangerous. Um, the the uh, receptacles could be much older. The receptacles last a, a very long time. Um, and in addition, the wiring, a lot of the older wiring in these homes could be frayed or damaged or, or for, for whatever reason, you know, AFCI could provide a lot of benefits. So Article 406 requires adding AFCI protection when replacing receptacles in locations identified in Article 210.12. That's, you know, the overall AFCI uh, article. So the question is, are there any concerns using AFCIs in these applications? And more specifically, what about older panels, you know, where uh, maybe a AFCI breaker may not be available? Any, any thoughts on that, Brian and, and Mike? Well, Brian, I'll let you go ahead and take it. Sure. So I have actually a lot of experience with uh, renovating uh, old houses, knob and tube wiring, uh, old two wire receptacles, that type of thing. Um, and what I'll tell you is this, um, you know, in the ideal world, the ideal situation where everything's wired perfectly, you have zero issues. Um, unfortunately, we don't live in the ideal world and nothing is ever wired perfectly. Um, and in fact, Mike and I, in a, in a project that we did when we were uh, checking for some other issues, installed AFCI breakers and they all tripped immediately in an existing scenario. And it was because one of the big issues that we've had in the industry over, I'm, I'm actually a third generation master electrician, uh, worked and grew up in the business. Um, over the years, we've had, um, what do we call them? Um, field practices that we, things that we do that maybe we didn't even realize were not necessarily code compliant. And so you'll have uh, two circuits coming into a switch box, for instance, and all the neutrals get tied together with a big blue wire nut because all the wires were white. And now I come into a home that was wired in, let's say the seventies, eighties. And I decide, Hey, you know, these, these people would like to uh, do some work. I'd like to put some AFCIs on all of the bedroom circuits, not just the new newly added renovation circuit. And we add it and they won't reset. And we have issues where we have either what we like to call mixed neutrals, which is when they're all tied together in a big wad or cross neutrals where the home runs get, mixed up between two different circuits and now these AFCIs can't operate. So the device itself uh, is obviously going to operate as designed if the installation is done correctly. Um, you know, talking about back in the 90s when AFCIs came out, there was an enormous amount of frustration on the part of the electrical installer, uh, especially business owners. The technology was new. Uh, a lot of the computer software that Mike was talking about was new. There were a lot of things when we designed new products that we don't think about and weren't taken into account. And so the nuisance tripping was, was just off the chain. I mean, it was just, a, just ridiculous. Um, as time has gone on now, uh, it's a completely different story. I, I think all of you in, in the manufacturing world ha have really seen the burden that was placed on the consumer and the installer both and the quality of devices that are being produced across the board today, I think uh, far exceed what anybody had expected when it came out. Um, so the, the problems now are, are miswiring primarily. Um, again, 
that pretty much the only thing I think we have left now is miswiring and then some odd combinations of equipment that might cause a nuisance trip. And I, I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. That's a good point, Brian. And again, we have Mr. Bill Grande here. So from a manufacturer's perspective, what have we done to address, you know, miswiring and, uh, you know, to that he said that uh, Brian mentioned that AFCIs have come a long way. A any thoughts on that, Bill? Yeah, I think the, the miswiring is a great point and the products do a good job because if there is a miswiring condition, they typically will not reset and you'll know right away. And the compatibility, uh, obviously, like you said, it's new technology, right? There's a lot of engineers, there's a lot of people looking at it. Mike, you were kind of talking about getting this library of known arcs, right? So this is, this is a light bulb, this is a motor, this is an arc. Uh, and it's looking at characteristics. So just like everything else technologically, uh, I think we'll continue to see advancements. I think there are still some compatibility challenges. Uh, we, we try to work with manufacturers of appliances and other things. Uh, and I think it's something where the industry needs to come together uh, between uh, the listing agencies and the code and the different suppliers, the, the safety devices, as well as the appliance manufacturers, the tool manufacturers, and make sure that the codes and standards may ensure that these are compatible. And, and I think the other point I would make is, I would expect this technology to grow and improve. I mean, you just look at what's happening, um, it's going to advance, and I think it's going to be a critical safety component going forward. When talking tech, how about an AFCI receptacle with Bluetooth connectivity? I know you're probably thinking, why? The answer is that it enables the receptacle to receive firmware updates to ensure it has the latest arc fault protection and detection technology. Using the Leviton Decora digital app via a local connection, professional contractors and homeowners can now more accurately troubleshoot trip events. The result is improved home safety for customers and fewer callbacks for electrical professionals. You can't truly have a smart home without smart AFCI safety devices. Find out more at leviton.com slash AFCI. As I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, that uh, AFCIs have become somewhat controversial. I mean, let's talk about electricity in general. It's something that the general public just takes for granted. You come home, you turn on a light switch, and, and voila, the lights come on. But, um, and, and for the most part, homeowners don't know from AFCI. They, they, they're not familiar with that technology. However, if a homeowner um, buys a more recent house that is equipped with an AFCI breaker or receptacle, uh, oftentimes there's nuisance tripping, right? And again, I know a lot of the guys tuned in today because that's something near and dear. The contractors don't like to go back and do the same job twice. So let's talk about nuisance tripping for, for a minute here. Mike, have you ever experienced, I know, said Mike, I know is, is passionate about the industry and I know he's always looking to uh, adopt new technologies. He wants to learn more. He, he's, he has a passion for this. So Mike, have you ever experienced nuisance tripping at your house when, with new devices? Today. So history. When the AFCIs came out in the dual function, AFCIs, GFCI, I was building a house and I got a certain manufacturer that came out with a product, I think one of the first, and they probably sent me the first set of breakers with the, the plug-in neutrals and I was all excited. I'm thinking about out of the 50 breakers, 30 of them tripped on a regular basis. So to me, no big deal. I'm an electrician, I'm going to turn it back off. Well, my wife is going nuts. And I say, babe, just open the panel, trip it back on, and there's five flash flashing lights, and then she's freaking all out. So finally, after a lot of crap, I take I get brand new ones from the manufacturer. And of course, I didn't pay for this. So I get brand new ones. I want to know how it worked out. And I replaced all the ones that were tripping. And they said, well, Mike, the software didn't anticipate certain things. And so we updated the software. We don't have a way right now to take current breakers and to update the firmware, you know, the software, that, you know, what it's looking for. I'm like, okay. So I replaced the 30 breakers. So now only about 10 of them are tripping regularly. I'm thinking that's pretty good, right? I'm happy. My wife is still going nuts because what happened? I routed the old house, get rid of these stupid things. And I'm explaining there what protects against fire, what protects an electric shock. She doesn't care. So I send those breakers back again, 
and I get another set, which of course it's another version. It's been updated as a firmware. And now I'm what left with about four breakers that are tripping on a regular basis. Now, when I send the breakers back, they do an analysis of what happened to the breakers. And it looks like most of this tripping that's taking place is because of Florida lightning that changes waveforms and the computer inside the electronic device doesn't know necessarily about this. So it reacts in some way. Utilities sometimes have their voltages are not always consistent. So a car hits a power line, causes a couple lines to raise in voltage, another line to go down in voltage. And then the GFCI is looking for the incoming voltage and it sees something like, oh, there's no voltage or it's a low voltage and they're designed to handle that. So now all of a sudden they're dropping offline because of under voltage or not the proper voltage coming in. So as you mentioned, and, and I don't have this problem here, but there's compatibility issues with equipment. There's always new equipment being produced and created. And then as the code expands its requirements and people start plugging in requirements, well, they never had that equipment in the factory to do the, the waveform calculations and everything like that. And so like, now we have a problem because we have a high end vacuum and it's, it's variable speeds. And because of the variable speed motor, it creates some high frequency discharge currents. And now this whole thing is so, Yes, I have problems right now in my house with about four GFCIs. Yeah, and make and it. I just trying to break her up. Yeah, and, and we are also seeing challenges for the, from the manufacturers of the those you know those appliances, those pieces of equipment, as they need to meet their energy efficiency standards, right? Right. And, and right. What, what are go. they doing with their switching power supplies? And and as you referenced, you know, you could get some high frequency ground leakage and things like that. Um, I think the, the one thing, and, and as you, you, what you were talking about is you're trying to anticipate the future. And, and what we, you know, I'll just put a plug in for some of the things that we're working on is what is the future is something that, okay, it works today and now something else is introduced and you don't have to send it back to the manufacturer. The manufacturer right. can just say, okay, Mike, we just updated and you're good. And that's, I think, when I talked before about this technology is just going to improve. I think that's the type of thing that you'll see going into the future. You're absolutely right. We're getting there, but it's, it's a struggle. Everyone keeps saying that smart Wi-Fi enabled circuit breakers are the future of load centers. Well, the future is now at Leviton. Our Wi-Fi enabled circuit breakers can communicate to your smartphone and provide information on individual branch circuits. You can even remotely trip the branch circuit if necessary. Say you left the spa on at your ski house. Not a problem. Trip it from anywhere. There's more. The smart breaker can monitor energy use and tell you how much energy you're consuming. This is the first step when trying to manage energy use. Connected smart breakers can accept firmware downloads from Leviton. This ensures that your house can receive the latest safety protection and detection technology. Sound advanced? It is. And this is just the beginning. The Leviton Load Center installs easier and faster than the competition. Install one and you'll never go back to the other guys. Check it out at leviton.com slash load center. Very good. Let's switch gears here a little bit and talk about GFCIs. And uh, for everybody in the room, we're all familiar with the GFCI receptacle, and for everybody on the uh, on the call, uh, we're all familiar with uh, GFCI receptacles and GFCI breakers. When you look at a receptacle, you know, if you ever really look at it closely, they say test monthly. And I'm going to start with Brian. Brian, do you go around you? Do you have like a schedule? Do you go around your house and okay, bathroom first, check. We this one works good. Have you ever done that, Brian? Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. And, and the sad thing is, I know you're supposed to test them every month. Uh, I will say I'm pretty good about pushing the button before I plug in outside. Because um, for whatever reason, that feels scarier because I'm outside working. So I usually take the ground prong of the plug and push the test button because you can barely reach that joker inside of the uh, bubble cover. And then I'll reset it and plug in and go to town. But uh, inside the house, not so much. And, and in fact, we used to send flyers out, our company did, to our customers telling them, hey, 
you should be testing your GFIs once a month. And if they don't work, call us so we can come replace them. But we know, you know, none of us ever did it ourselves. So it's uh, unfortunately, I have to admit, no, guilty. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think you're alone, Brian. And, uh, you know, Leviton have, uh, has brought GFCIs a long way over the years. Uh, Bill, What's, what's your input on the self-test feature there? I think, uh, as you said, they have come a long way. And if you look at the standards, you know, we have the code part and we have the standards part, the UL, CSA, and, and things like that. And there's probably been about three or four major revisions over the past 20 years. So, so the GFCI that you're seeing today is not the GFCI that you had, Mike, you're talking about from the 1970s and 1980s. You still see some of them in use. And uh, you'll go, and you could go and test some of them, and they won't trip. But yet they still provide power, and th and that was always the case. And so 20, 30, 40 years later, these electronics have been live 24-7, you know, and, and over time components can fail. If you don't test them, you won't know. So what UL has done in the manufacturers is now they've introduced self-test. And there's what you call the end of life. What happens when it can't offer protection? You either need to let the person know through a signal or you need to prevent power from being connected. So I think, again, just like we talked about with AFCIs and, and how they're going to progress, GFCIs, even you know, 50 years later, they're still progressing and improving with the technology that we have today. So, so I think it's been a lot of improvements we've seen. Terrific, Bill. Well, let's take a quick break here, and then we're going to go on to other areas of electrical that we want to ask Mike and Brian to get some uh, deeper insight. So let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Leviton recently introduced Decora Smart Wi-Fi second gen controls. The line includes a dimmer, switch, and mini plug-in switch and dimmer. These devices complement the existing Leviton line of wireless Wi-Fi products. They don't require a hub and install just like traditional devices. All Decora smart devices are easy to program and control through any smartphone. The second gen devices work with the My Leviton app and are compatible with Amazon Alexa, Hey Google, Apple HomeKit Siri, IFTTT, and more. There are two new wireless anywhere companion dimmers and switches that can be installed anywhere without wires for easy three-way and multi-location control. Check out the entire line at leviton.com. As a special thanks for listening to our podcast, we'd like to offer you a Leviton AFCI receptacle. The receptacle provides NEC compliant arc fault protection for retrofit and new construction applications. See the National Electrical Code for appropriate installation requirements. Just visit leviton.com slash podcast offer and tell us where to ship. This offer is just for podcast listeners for a limited time and while supplies last. We hope you enjoyed this first episode. Join us soon for the second half of this conversation with our special guest, Mike Holt.